Again, I want to mention the uh, lectureship book that's available in the back. And uh, we, I feel like we owe a great deal of gratitude to uh, Jack and Katie Gilchrist for their role in uh, editing this book. And uh, I recommend it to you if you, uh, they, can, they can certainly get one of those for you if you're interested in having a, uh, the lectureship book. It's a very well bound, very, very well put together book in my opinion. And we uh, also wanted to observe this morning, I felt like was a, was a very good beginning to this week of lectures, um, three wonderfully delivered lectures. And uh, so Eddie is here to call all that to a screeching halt. <laughs> As it happens, um, if you were here for the morning session, Tim Knup uh, had the 11 o'clock lecture. Another, another man that graduated with the same class is here to speak to us. And I mentioned that class. There was a, it was a very unique and in many ways an outstanding class. I think it was probably the biggest class we ever had to go through this school. But <clears throat> Eddie was a part of that. And Eddie, kidding aside, has been doing outstanding work since the time he graduated in 2001. And we, of course, have been very pleased with him for a long time. He's been at Steelton in New Martinsville since 2004. Uh, he is one of our instructors here at the school and does a great job with the material that he's asked to present here. And one of those things is Bible geography, which is a pretty specialized department. And uh, Eddie takes care of that, plus a couple of other things for us. But uh, Eddie, it's also worth mentioning, I think, that uh, Eddie represents two generations of students since a couple of years ago. His older child, Hunter, uh, attended and graduated from this school, and he and Kim also have daughter Cameron. I think she just started college, right? And uh, anyway, Eddie is here today to speak to us on Psalm 11, God is Righteous. They're happy to be here this afternoon, certainly appreciative of the opportunity to to take my part in the lectureship. Appreciate uh, the kind words from uh, Brother Dan. I expected something different. I, I really did, and I'm um, certainly grateful for that and appreciative of, uh, of that. It is good to see uh, Tim and Mark as uh, they were classmates of uh, mine. We have a lot of memories of the school and of this auditorium and the good church here and I appreciate spending a few few days and a few moments with with those those good men. We're studying Psalm 11 this afternoon. This uh, hour and the next hour seem to be difficult hours right after lunch all the jokes, you know, all the uh, we're going to try to, you know, we're all going to fall asleep and that type of thing. That that's all right. That certainly happens, but whether you're asleep or not, I'm going to preach. I'm going to keep going and just keep preaching. I was in a gospel meeting out in the country a little church uh, called Wallace. Some of you know about Wallace, and the, the brethren don't meet there anymore. But the electric was off one night. I went through, and they asked me if, they said, can you preach in the dark? You know, and of course, you know, I always preach in the dark. Someone's going to say that. But I said, well, I think I can. That's no problem. And I used to preach, and it was just pitch black. I couldn't see a face in that um, uh, room. And I was about halfway through. The lesson was going great, I thought, and the lights came on. And there wasn't a soul there. No, they... <laughs> They all snuck out. The, no, they were all there, and it kind of threw me off after that. You know, I kind of had gone so long with nobody in the room, and uh, kind of threw me off. So, uh, be that as it is, we're going to study Psalm 11 together here uh, this afternoon. You know, Psalm 11, in my estimation and my study of it, and I just um, was so glad to have it, so glad to have that psalm, because in a lot of ways it's a perfect reflection of uh, what's going on even in the church today. And though uh, I would certainly uh, hesitate to compare gospel preachers with King David, I think, um, and there are a lot of preachers in our assembly here today, there are a lot of ways that uh, we can gain some thoughts from this psalm 
that might, uh, might help us. If you'll allow me to read a paragraph right out of uh, my manuscript, I'm going to do that. Um, because I don't, I don't think I can sum it up as well as it's just written there, and it won't take just a moment. In our present time, spiritual interest is low while immorality is high. Pornography is easily accessed, whereas a Bible phrase on a T-shirt is unacceptable in many public schools. Sadly, in America, boys are often encouraged to identify as girls and girls as boys. Homosexuality and transgenderism is praised while biblical marriage is ridiculed. Unborn babies will find no protection in this nation that formerly trusted in God. Abortion is vehemently defended by a sizable portion of our society, and many women march in our streets to, quote, shout their abortion. Illegal drug abuse has become a plague in our nation. Tragically, young men and women find their names in the obituaries instead of on the sports page or the academic achievement section found overdosed on drugs. God's question to Ezekiel is a timely one for us. And I bring this up, let me interject as I'm reading uh, my own paragraph. I know we're not studying the book of Ezekiel, but if you read the book of Ezekiel, especially chapters 8 and 9, God allows Ezekiel to see what's going on, the abominations that are going on in Israel, even in the, in the temple by God's people. And the men and the women and the elders and others in that nation were committing terrible uh, acts of abomination. And God said to Ezekiel, Son of man, have you seen this? And then he went on to say... Um, turn again, you will see greater abominations than these. In that vision, God allowed Ezekiel to see six men with battle axes and told them to go through the streets. And there was another man with um, a pen there, and he was writing on the foreheads of those who sighed and those who cried over the abominations that were going on. And those are the ones who were spared. Do you sigh? Do you cry? Do you care about what's going on, Ezekiel? Do you, brother and sister, do you sigh? Do you cry? Do you care about what's going on? I know you do. I know we have a, an assembly filled with people today who know about the atrocities, who know about the abominations, who know about the things that are going on even in our own country. But something that you do know about, and I'm going to mention here, is unbelievably preachers are often told not preach on these things. Uh, maybe you, gospel preaching brother, maybe you've been told, just, just don't preach on this. Just, just don't say anything about it. Uh, we don't want to be found preaching on politics. We don't want to offend anybody here. Just, just preach the gospel you don't want to preach on politics. Why don't you just keep your head down, preach about God, just preach about the gospel, but, but just don't mention that. Don't mention those things that are going on. You might offend somebody. You might upset somebody. Uh, believe it or not, that's basically what David was told. I'm going to read Psalm 11 here in just a moment, and though we're going to do it differently, really, than I did in the manuscript somewhat, uh, we're going to focus on a couple different words. The first word is flee, and the second word is focus. The first three verses, David is uh, really advised to flee, to run. And, and just to be honest, sometimes he did. Sometimes David did have to run. He did have to flee to spare his life. But on this occasion, David didn't like that advice at all. In fact, he says in the psalm, and I'm going to read it in its entirety in a moment, how can you say unto my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? How can you even say that? And so we're going to talk about uh, what he was told. He was told just to flee, just to run. There's nothing you can do. If the foundations are destroyed, David, what can the righteous do? The best thing for you to do now is just to run, is just to flee. And then the second part of the psalm, verses 4 through 7, I use the word focus. And it's David's focus as he's thinking about God on his throne. And, and as we talk about it, it's going to become so evident to us, I hope, and I hope you can follow this as, as I do my best to present God's Word uh, to us here this afternoon. We're going to see that focus that David had, that though, yes, there are things going on around uh, D David at that time, and there are things going on around us, but God is also active, and God is also so on his throne. You see, King Saul may have been on the throne in Israel, but God was on his throne in heaven. And so David calls a remembrance there and a focus that God is on his throne. And the same focus is true for us today. Though things are going on in this country and around the world that, that we know God doesn't approve of. We don't approve of those things. And we can't run and we can't flee and we can't, uh, we can't really uh, duck and flee to the mountain and say, well, I won't preach on those things. I I'll make sure I don't offend anyone that may be in uh, in the assembly where I'm preaching. So we're going to see a great focus by, by David. Let's read the psalm together. Uh, psalm 11 
In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow on the string, that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance upholds, or pardon me, beholds the upright. Those first three verses... Uh, I, I really call those a question of fear. The question is in verse 3. Uh, I would interpret these first three verses to be David's depiction of the advisors. Maybe they were friends of his. We don't really know the context of the statement. I've already mentioned it may have been King Saul who was still on the throne. For about ten years David, uh, David um, faced that, the jealousy, the rage of King Saul. And that may have been the context. I believe that was the context. That's the way I'm going to set it forth uh, here this afternoon as we study this chapter of the Bible together. And so King Saul was on the throne. His jealousy and his rage against King David and he wanted to kill, or against David who wasn't the king at this point, I don't believe. And uh, this rage there. And David begins by saying, I'm going to put my trust in, in the Lord. And these three, the three things we're going to look at in these three verses, I'm going to call them an inappropriate suggestion. At least David felt that it was inappropriate. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? How how can you say that? It was something that, that David seemed, seemingly took personal offense to. It offended David to even be told to flee in this case. It offended him at the case. Um, in the second place is not only this inappropriate suggestion, but what I call an insightful explanation. Verse 2 is still the advisors when they say, For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly the upright in heart. And then an impotent question. Uh, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? David, what can you do? Just, just run. Just flee. Just spare your life today. And so let's think about that inappropriate suggestion in the first place. David took offense to this. It bothered David. It bothered him for them to tell him to flee as a bird to your mountain. Just, just run. That's really the picture that we see there and in this place. And many times in the Psalms, birds are mentioned. Owls and pelicans and eagles and uh, others are mentioned. Uh, flee as a bird. Take refuge like a bird does. You know, birds don't typically stand and fight. Birds typically just fly off. They typically go somewhere where there is safety. David, just find some safety if you can find, uh, if you can find it. Well, David at times did flee for safety. Don't, don't misunderstand David here standing here in this place. At times he did flee. Do you remember at times when Saul would throw a javelin at him, a spear at him, and David would, uh, would certainly flee? Sometimes we should flee. There's, there are times to where it's good to get out of a situation. In Matthew 10 and verse 23, Jesus said, When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. Uh, he told them, Matthew 10 and verse 23. And so so David was being persecuted by, by King Saul. But David began with these, these words, In the Lord I put my, my trust. I'm going to put my trust in Him. I, I'm going to stay faithful to Him. You know, brethren, God's messengers have often been told to flee. God's messengers have often been told, Why don't you stop preaching this? Why don't you flee? Why don't you run? Why don't you go somewhere else? I know you can't help but think of Amos. And I just want to mention a few words. You know, Amos went up to the northern kingdom of Israel and in Amos chapter 7, uh, just this great chapter when Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy. Never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence. Well, we don't want to hear that preaching up here. Just, just go back home and preach. We don't want to hear that nonsense. You go down there and eat your bread. You go down there, make a living. You go down there and preach. 
Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. I love that. That gives me chills even to read that, brethren, to think about that. You're going into a hostile environment. You're preaching a message they don't want to hear. And Amaziah says, We don't want to hear that. You go home. And, and the name is say, Listen, I, I was a prophet or the son of a prophet. I was just a regular guy doing my work, and the Lord sent me up here to preach. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. I'm going to preach it while I'm here. Uh, he wasn't uh, he, he wasn't intimidated. He wasn't um, bullied to the point that he said, I'm not going to preach this message anymore. He continued to preach that message. You remember Stephen, when Stephen preached in Acts chapter 7, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and years, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do ye. They stopped their ears. But he didn't stop his preaching. They ran on that good man and they, they stoned him. They took his life, but he didn't quit preaching. The Apostle Paul said the time would come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap unto themselves teachers, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside unto fables. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, You may not like to hear this, but most of the persecution that has gone to prophets and messengers of God and preachers and teachers has been from God's people. Now, maybe not God's people in the, the faithful sense of the word, but many times the leadership of God's people, it was King Saul who persecuted David. One time, the anointed of, of the Lord. It was the religious leaders who crucified the Son of God and instigated that crucifixion of the Son of God. It was that Sanhedrin council that many of, many of whom vowed that they would not eat until they killed uh, the Apostle Paul. And on and on and on and on we could go throughout uh, the Scriptures. But I can't help but think, and I remind myself of this when I preach, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Uh, I'm more worried about God and His Son Jesus Christ, who is my judge, than I am uh, the Amaziahs of the world and the King Saul's of the world and others today who say, don't preach that message, preacher. Don't be preaching politics. Don't, don't be doing that. Don't preach that. I'm much more concerned with Him and with God than I am uh, with others here. And so we see an inappropriate suggestion, verse 1. Verse 2, we see an insightful explanation. They're saying, for look, and you see the word for there, for look. Uh, here's the reason that, that this, um, this uh, advice is, you know, that it's, it's logical, David. Look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. In essence, they're telling David, David, don't you know they're watching you? Don't you know that there's archers out there waiting? Don't you know that, that those archers like sharp shooters? Like, like a sniper who's, it, maybe he's in a ghillie suit and he's got his rifle and a scope and he's there, he's ready, his finger on the trigger. As soon as you step out, David, they're going to take your life. You should just flee, get out, run while you can, David. That sounds like pretty good advice, although David didn't accept it, at least not uh, on, on this occasion. Satan's bow is still bent. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. There are those who do not like plain gospel preaching. I think part of the um, part of the adversity that I've received in gospel preaching is because I'm so plain, and I don't. I'm not trying to take take any credit or any glory to myself. But we don't like plain gospel preaching. We don't want the preacher to be so plain. We like generic sermons in the church today. Be generic enough to where there's some truth and, and a lot of people can make some good application, but don't come right down on it and nail it down. That's my problem. I, I, I hit the nail right on the head many times. People say, we don't like that. We, we, don't, we don't want that. You can't say that, preacher. Why? What are you trying to do? Lose your job? Don't you really? Don't you know that they've, they've got their the arrows pulled back? They're just waiting? I 
I've heard preach, and I've had it told me before, you're going to lose your job preaching that way. I think that's a reflection of this exact verse. For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. It isn't just abortion. It isn't just homosexuality. It's marriage, divorce, and remarriage. In many places. You preach on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Don't make the application. Don't make it so plain that people know what you're talking about. Don't make it that plain. Just, just, just preach it in a general way. Let people read Matthew 19, Matthew 5. Let people read those chapters on their own. Let people make their own application. And you just go on your way. Just, just don't make it too plain, preacher. Marriage, divorce, and remarriage. It may be biblical repentance. Don't make it so plain. It might be the leadership crisis that we have. Wendell Winkler said that. Leadership, the crisis of our time. We have a leadership crisis. And people don't like to talk about it. Preachers talk about it privately, but we don't like to talk about it much publicly. That we've taken the biblical role of leadership as it is in the church and the wisdom of God and the organization, the government of church, and we've, we've turned it around and we've made a pastor system. We really have. Uh, we certainly have. Now, a lot of that comes from denominationalism. We've converted people. I, I was converted out of denominationalism. We've converted people out of denominationalism and not taught them that the, the preacher isn't the pastor. He's a preacher. He's an evangelist. Don't be too plain, preacher. Don't be too plain. An insightful explanation, verse 2. Verse 3, an impotent question. Now, commentators are somewhat divided. Who's saying this in verse 3? Is it David who's saying, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Or is it the advisors? I'm taking the role, with, uh, the position is the advisors. That the advisors are just, they're adding to this. David, run. David, flee. Because if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? What can you really do, David? That's, that's the position that I'm holding on uh, in this passage. The foundations seem to be, and I quote from Briggs, the foundations are the established institutions, the social and civil order of uh, the community. And so when the moral foundations, I'm not sure these are religious foundations, but when the moral foundations of society are, are turned upside down, uh, what can the righteous do? That's an impotent question. There's no power in that. There must be no power in um, righteousness. There must be no power in gospel preaching. There must be no power in someone standing faithfully for, for God. Briggs also said this, These enemies are not only enemies of the righteous, but they are pulling down all the institutions and good order of society. These institutions protect the right-minded righteous. When they are destroyed, the righteous are exposed to violence of all kinds. We must mention that these, these topics, these modern topics like abortion and homosexuality aren't really about abortion and homosexuality. They're about a rejection of Christianity and the moral fabric of uh, what our society ought to be. These are just footballs that they're carrying. They don't really care. Uh, those behind this don't really care about quote-unquote women's reproductive rights or your right to um, love who you want to love and all the little phrases. It's not about that. It's about a rejection of God. It's about a rejection of God's Word. That's exactly what it's about. And when those things happen and then they happen more and more and more and more and whether we like to admit it or not and, and Tim hit on this a moment ago he mentioned this that we don't feel much fear here today and I, I don't feel much fear here today by the way a lot of times people say boy you're a courageous preacher for preaching that you mean an assembly of God's people who, who ought to believe what I'm saying um Anyway, but it could come to the point. It could come to the point to where if we stand up and preach, we might be thrown uh, in jail for, for that type of preaching. It's a tearing down of the moral and the religious standards in, um, in, in our country. And so the question, what can the righteous do? Let me answer that just a little bit. What can the righteous do? I mentioned six things. I'm not going to spend any time on these, really. What can the righteous do? Uh, when, when, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, we can pray. Jesus spoke that parable to them in Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 that men ought always to pray and not to lose heart. We can fast with our, with our prayers. Uh, Isaiah 58 and verse 4 mentions that your voice may be heard on high. You know, fasting is still a Bible doctrine. There's still something that we see in the Bible. And many times it was fasting in, and prayer, putting that relationship 
reliance upon God and upon spiritual things. We can live faithfully, which includes our worship, our service, and our devotion to God. We can, let me quote Paul, we can watch ye stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13. We can allow our voices to be heard in elections. We still have that freedom in this country. They don't have a lot of places. Suppose they have that freedom in China to, to, to do that and other communist places around the world. We, we have that. A lot of Christians say, well, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to do it. Well, that's your decision, but uh, that's something at least we have. Still, Christians are able in this country to cast a vote. And it's not all about politicians, but we're able at least to, to cast a vote. And then we're able to trust completely and entirely in our God. Those are some of my thoughts. But what's David's thoughts? Let's go to 4 through 7 now. 4 through 7, realize those first three verses, we looked at uh, the, the fleeing or the question of fear. And now verses 4 through 7 seems to me to be David's response. David's response uh, to focus upon God, uh, to have faith in God. And he says in verse 4, The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. And so this is a remembrance, a reminder to us that God... God is on His throne. That's what David is saying. King Saul may be on the throne of Israel, but God rules from heaven. You remember Daniel 4, don't you, in verse 25? Why, uh, the Lord rules in the kingdoms of men. And that's still true today. That hasn't changed. Jesus is still King of kings and Lord of lords, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15. He still is the one who says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. You remember when He stood before Pontius Pilate? And he said, no power at all could be given thee, or you would have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Those rulers today still stand under the rule of, of God ultimately. And so what is the lesson uh, from David? The lesson is stop looking around at how bad things have become and start looking up at God upon the throne. And that ought to be our lesson today. Uh, we can tend to become so cynical. We can tend to uh, become so cynical skeptical and so fearful that we forget that God's on His throne. We forget that God knows what's going on. And I'm going to point that out as, as I read David's uh, case here. David's advisors had laid out a case. This is what your enemies are doing. David, you need to run. Why? Because they've got the bow bent. They're, they're looking at you, David. They're watching you and they're going to take your life from you. So they laid out a case. This is what your enemies are doing. And David says, now let me tell you what God is doing. And he starts to tell them about about God. You might notice that the word Lord there is all caps. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's Yahweh. And we see that five times in, in this text. Typically that's the case. Sometimes it is translated that way and it isn't, it, it isn't Yahweh, but, but it is here in, in this place. And so David wanted to focus on, on Yahweh. He wanted to focus on, on God. Uh, in the next place there's a recognition here in verse 4, the second part of it says, His eyes behold. In other words, God knows what's going on. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous. Um, his eyelids. The picture there is the squinting of the eyes. The squinting of the eyes. Uh, Charnock said this, this phrase is a metaphor taken from men that, that contract the eyelids when they would wisely and accurately behold a thing. Here's the point that I really like. It is not a transient and careless look. David is saying God's eyelids behold. His eye, he's squinting his eyes as he's focusing. You ever do that Take a, and just kind of just squint your eyes where you can just focus on a word on a page? We all do it without thinking probably. David said his eyelids behold. God knows what's going on. Not just, not just he has knowledge of it. His eyelids behold. He's, he's focusing on it. He knows what's going on. He sees what's going on. And we should understand and that, that same thing is true today. How many of the Psalms, how many of them do we read phrases like, How long, O Lord? Lord, how long will you, will you sleep forever? Um, do you know what's going on? Do you see what's going on? And, and that's David as a man or, or any of the other writers or me as a man or as a preacher or you as a Christian. Do you ever pray that prayer or at least think that thought? And if David did or Jeremiah did or one of these other great men did, I'm not exempt from that. Sometimes saying, Lord... Do you see what's going on here? Do you know what's going on? Do you know what's happening? Why do you let this go on? 
And, and that's, we would probably, I would be untrue if I said, I've never prayed that. I've never thought that. God, why are you allowing this to go on for this long? That's, that's really the message sometimes we see. And now the answer here that I need to be reminded of is, the Lord is on His throne. Uh, he, he's not indifferent to this. He's not ignorant to what's going on. He knows not only does He know, He knows He's focusing upon it. He sees it. He knows what's going on. But then David reminds us in verse 5, he also reminds us that the Lord tests the righteous. It's not just the wicked that, that he tests. He also tests uh, the righteous. Barnes said this, the Lord tries the righteous, that is, He proves them, searches them, tests the reliability of their piety. His dealings with them are such as to test the genuineness of their religion and are designed to show their sincerity and the real power of their religious principles. It is not for the purpose of destroying them or punishing them that He deals with them as He does, but it is to show the reality of their attachment to Him. This language seems here to be used to show the feeling of the persecuted and afflicted author of the psalm. He understood the reason why these calamities were suffered to come upon him, to wit, as a trial of his faith. And therefore it was his duty to remain and bear these troubles and not attempt to escape from them by flight. What Barnes is saying, if you didn't read along or you didn't get that so plainly as I was reading, is that David considered this to be a test of his faith. And if he tucks tail and runs now, that it's really a lack of faith in God. He's going to trust in God. I need, I need that lesson. I need that message. I think we all do. That sometimes it just seems easier. Let me throw in the towel. Let, let me just throw in the towel. Let me go back to fishing the way Peter said. Let me do that. And But David would say, no, God knows what's going on. He's testing your faith. And we can't always say that every, everything that may happen to us is a test. I, I don't know that I can say that. But I know David at least here says, the Lord tests the righteous. And we need to understand that. But then he says, but the wicked. And I'm going to call this a, a recompense. But the, the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. These are metaphors of judgment. Metaphors of judgment here. Notice there are three of them. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind. Well, these are, these are figures of, of judgment. I, I like this contrast in the psalm. In the psalm we see the contrast that the wicked are trying to throw down the foundations. They're trying to throw down the foundations of, of morality and, and right and, and godliness. They're trying to throw those down. While they're trying to do that, God is raining down uh, fire and brimstone. Can you see the contrast there? David is saying God is going to throw down... And in, in fact, God is going to punish these ones. Sodom and Gomorrah's absence from the earth is a reminder that God will take care of this. That God will rain down this, these coals and this burning flame from heaven. Genesis 19.24 says, Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. A burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. You see the word cup there, do you not? You remember Jesus said, Let this cup pass from me. I think the cup there was the cup of the wrath of God. Um, but here, the cup, uh, this cup, this is going to be the portion of their cup. Not a drop of mercy, but a cup of misery is going to be poured out on these, these wicked ones. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10 and verse 31. For our God is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12 and verse 29. Uh, and none of us say this with any pleasure at all, but hell awaits those wicked ones who reject God and uh, His anointed today. Uh, you know, the Bible says, Paul said, And you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why, I shudder to think about that. I shudder to think about that day. It's glorious. 
glorious day, but to think about the Lord returning and Michael the archangel there shouting and, and the shout of the Lord, the voice of that archangel and those angels being sent out and what that's going to be like someday. I don't know what that's going to be like, but I know what I may suffer maybe as a gospel preacher, as a Christian, or what David suffered as, as a righteous, godly man is nothing compared to what one day will happen. The, these injustices will be taken care of. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said this. This is my favorite quote that I, that I ran across in studying for this lecture. O oh, people of God, how foolish is it to fear the faces of men who shall soon be faggots in the fires of hell. Think of their end, their fearful end, and all fear of them must be changed into contempt of their threatenings and pity for their miserable estate. We fear and we worry about things going on here. And Spurgeon says, don't fear them, pity them. Pity them, don't, don't fear them. And then lastly, there's a reward uh, mentioned here. Let me, let me read those last few verses. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire, and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. There's a reward for those righteous ones and those faithful ones. What an inspiring psalm in a time of moral decline and persecution of God's people. These seven verses, these seven verses of David's hymn are truly a treasure for God's people of all time. They remind us to be faithful unto our Lord who is upon His throne. In another psalm, David wrote, The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Let me end with this quote. This is also from Spurgeon. Mammon, the flesh, the devil will all whisper in our ear, flee as a bird to your mountain. But let us come forth and defy them all. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. There's no room or reason for retreat. Advance, let the vanguard push on to the front. All ye powers and passions of our soul, on, on, in God's name, on. For the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge.